Mr. Wicker's Window by Carly Dawson, Chapter 4. When Chris came to himself, he woke from sleep and lay for a moment without opening his eyes. He waited with his usual sense of irritation for Aunt Rachel's step at the window, or saying, or saying, Get up, Chris! Your leg again! But the step did not come, and feeling rested and hungry, Otis opened his eyes. What was this? The high, regular walls of his bedroom were not around him, nor the familiar furniture. Chris sat up, rubbing in his eyes as if this would help clear his vision, and looked about him. He was in a narrow bed in a sunny, well, sunny room, an attic room, it would seem to be, for the walls slanted down in different sharp angles from the low ceiling to the broad wood planks of the floor. Two dormer windows projected from the room on the roof, making two niches in the wall across from which er, this lay. And the third window in the wall above his head showed that the room, as well as being at the top of the house, was also at a corner of it. A door was just beyond the foot of the bed, a chest of drawers and a table with a blue and white porcelain washbowl and pitcher stood along the farther side. Wooden pegs were placed at hand level here and there, and a rag rug and wet colors lay on the floor by the bed. The walls were white and the sunlight poured in to dash itself upon the floor and splash up the walls in irresistible gaiety. There was no doubt about it, bare though it was. It was a pleasing room. Snug and cheerful, and somehow well suited to a thirteen year old boy. Chris half smiled as he looked, leaning on one elbow, and then his smile faded as he caught sight of the chair and what it held. The only chair in the room was laid with carefully folded clothes, but they were not Chris's clothes. Chris jumped out of bed and looked around with the startled intake of his breath. He was wearing a white nightshirt, something he'd never even seen before and barely heard of. The sleeves were long and cuffed, and the nightshirt fell in linen lines to his feet. Golly Moses! Chris explained, completely baffled. He returned to the examination of the clothes that were obviously laid out for him. It was a fine white shirt with full sleeves and turned back cuffs, white cotton stockings, knee breeches of blue gray worsted material, and matching frock coat with silver card buttons. Below the chair, Chris saw, was a pair of black leather shoes with polished silver buckles. Fancy dress, huh? Chris murmured, and then, as if he'd been slapped into full awareness, came in the remembrance of an evening before, of Mr. Wicker, and of the dark, flickering shop. Chris sat down suddenly on the edge of the bed, his mouth, in spite of all his efforts, drawn down at the corners, and his eyes blank with confusion and misery. Oh, my golly! Chris said, and stared at the clothes he still had held in his hands. Then another idea struck him, and he jumped up to run to the nearest dormer window, the floorboards where the sun had laid on them, warm under his bare feet. But no, no freeway, no factories. The window looked out over Water Street, skirting edge of the Potomac Banks, and there below Chris's amazed eyes rose a forest of masts and spars of ships at anchor along the shore. Water Street, below him, was swarming with activity, but not the activity that Chris had previously known. Men dressed in the same sort of clothes as those laid out for him, clushed at cotton bales, rolled hogsheads along to the docks, or rowed out to ships anchored in midstream. Most of the stevedores were hatless, and Chris snickered at the sight of the short braid of hair that the leaps of their necks. Many wore brilliant scarves tied around their necks, red, or mustard, green, or yellow, or green and the sound of deep voices swearing, laughing, or rising in unfamiliar sea chanties excited Chris and sent the blood tingling along his veins. He rushed to the high-place window overlooking Wisconsin Avenue. No key bridge was to be seen in the distance, only stretches of fields and orchards scattered with occasional houses of russet brick, and when he craned his neck there was the inn where the people's drugstore ought to be, the sign swinging high above the road. Wisconsin Avenue? You just had to laugh. <laughs> if it could see itself. Only a wide, muddy road full of ruts and puddles, along with someone in his line of geese was waddling, impervious to the cursing of passing carters and riders on horseback. A little below him, Chris could see the two old warehouses he remembered from the night before, but now they looked quite new their bricks bright and their walls solid. Barrels were being lifted by the winch and tackle into the upper loft, and Chris watched the busy scene for quite some time. His rolling stomach and a simultaneous smell of food reminded him of his hunger. Dressing quickly in the strange new clothes, he opened the door and peered outside. A deep woman's voice loudly singing. 
Yeah, well, I know do to you, Spanish ladies. Came rolling up the stairway to the accompaniment of brisk clatter of pots and pans. What rose also to Chris's nostrils with the smell of newly baked bread, frying bacon, and wood smoke, and the combination put an end to his indecision. For a while he decided to call a truce to any attempt at solving the mystery in which he found himself and followed his nose, went softly down the stairs. Rounding the last turn of the staircase, Chris remained in its shadow while he stared with unbelieving eyes at the room and the finger before him. If this is a dream, he said to himself, it's the best wine I've ever had. The best. What confronted Chris was Mr. Wicker's kitchen. This room took up almost all the side wing of the house. And Ross from Chris, two casement windows showed the shrubs and flowers and white picket fence of Mr. Wicker's garden, and to the left were the back door opening up onto Broader Street, flanked by two smaller windows. These seemed most inviting, each possessing a picket window seat from which one could watch the busy comings and goings of the docks with a view of the ships beyond. But what drew Chris's eyes and made him grow round with wonder was the extraordinary figure in front of the fireplace. The vast, deeply set fireplace was in the wall that faced the back door. So deep was it, it was, that there was even a bench on one side of it, and over the smoking logs were hung all manner of trivets, spits, and cooking irons. It was, in short, a fireplace such as Chris had never dreamed of. Yet the tall, buxom woman stirring the hissing pots and singing to herself was what held Chris rooted to the last step of the attic stair. The woman stood easily six feet, broad and brawny enough to be a match for any man, almost any man. Countless yards of sprigged cotton must have gone into the making of her dress, to say nothing of her apron. A massive fichu of fleshly laundered muslin went around her head and was tucked into her bodice. A white turban was on her head, but on top of the turban... Chris could simply could not believe his eyes as he counted rapidly. On top of this amazing woman's head was a gigantic hat supporting twenty-four roses and twelve waving black plumes. As if blissfully unaware that her costume was not the usual one for cooking, the woman hummed and stirred, tasted, and hung up her ladle. But the sight was too much for Chris. Before he could stop it, a shout of laughter exploded from his lips. He laughed and laughed in the indignant expression on the woman's face when she turned. Stare glaring at him with her arms on her drawing lips only added to Chris's laughter. <laughs> at last, sobering up somewhat as he realized his behavior was rude, to put it mildly. Chris stopped and caught his breath, shaken only now and again by a, a diminishing paroxysm. Sending the spark of bad temper in the red face of the enormous woman, Chris decided to pour oil on the troubled waters. Good morning, ma'am. I'm, I'm Chris Madison from upstairs. I'm sorry I laughed so loud. I, He floundered and grabbed desperately at any passing idea. I saw something comical out the window there, he waited wildly. It just set me off. I hope it didn't disturb you. Mollified, though not entirely, the woman accepted this effort at peacemaking. Her face eased a little. Well, now, so you're awake at last, eh? And hungry being a boy, I don't doubt. She moved to the dresser and took down a mug and plate, the roses and ostriches' plumes moving in evident agreement. So you are crass, did you say? Christopher, that would be. And I, a mistress and Rebecca Booza, should you be wanting to know. Becky Booza, they call me. She bustled over her covered bowl, dipped out creaming milk with the long hangle dipper, and set bread, butter, and bacon in front of Chris at a table pulled up to one of the window seats. Eat now, young man, Becky Boozer advised, every red rose and feather extending her words, for Mr. Wicker will be wanting to see you when you have done. It's late. Asked eight of the clock. She glanced out the window. It might be just possible the master silly will be passing by before long for a midden morning snack, and here I am gossiping with you instead of getting on with my work. Chris ate with a will, looking around as he chewed. The spotless black floor and the starched curtains, the windows, the shining copper pans hung beside the huge fireplace were proof of Becky Boozer's housekeeping. Don't you have an ice box? Chris asked, his mouth full. What may that be? Uh, he asked sharply. To keep the food cool. Becky stopped to consider this, her hands on her hips. 
We have a lot on the cool side of the house, if that be what you mean, she told him, nodding. Keeps the food pretty well up to April or May. Then the heat makes everything go. Oh, this heat. Prosperity in Maryland, where I come from, and on the seacoast as it is, was never like this. The end of part one of chapter four.